Okay, the on-air thing isn't on, so I never know. Okay, welcome everybody to um, the uh, April 30th workshop, joint workshop with the Town Council and the um, partners from Colby and Company um, Engineering and um, Scott Simon Architects. I, I'm going to largely um, have Howard and the, the partners do the talking tonight, but I would like to um, leave time at the beginning and at the end of this evening if there's any public that would like to um, speak and address their concerns or, or comments. Um, so we'll have, a, we'll have an option right now if anybody would like to speak and then we'll have an option later after the presentation. So anybody would like to speak now, you can come up to the podium. Okay. I'm a Hi, I'm Catherine Adams. Um, I have lived here since 1989, so that's 30 some odd years. Um, I have four children. I live in Broad Cove. I am a believer in our school system. I moved away. I came back. I'm kind of one of those stories that you want to have happen in Cape Elizabeth. I look at my children now, and they're going into the, the school system, and a lot of the things in the schools are the same. They're the exact same floors, the same everything. That's not an issue. What is an issue is now the safety. Um, I walk in, I get buzzed in, and I walk past the cafeteria and the gymnasium. Those are where our main meeting points of our, for our children are. And the fact that someone could come in and something could happen without anybody having a visual line of sight to a human, um, it's, that's ridiculous to me. It doesn't make sense. So I fully support, I'm sorry I just ran in, I fully support um, this uh, opportunity the, to do the renovation, and I know we're in a challenging budget, budget year, but um, ultimately, I think this is just something we can't avoid any longer. Um, something bad could happen, and I would hate for it to be on our conscience. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> no one else? Okay. Um, so now I would like uh, Howard Coulter, our superintendent, to sort of introduce how this all began, the genesis of it. Thank you. So I'll just say a few words. I really want to get to this presentation, so I'll be very brief. Um, last year, last school year, um, and early on in, in the year, I was hearing from um, primarily from teachers and staff of concerns about the buildings. Um, and these were largely around safety. They weren't only that, but, but largely around safety. Um, and the more we looked into this and walked around and, and had tours, we realized there's, um, you don't have to go very far to realize that um, it's time to correct and improve upon um, things that have been in place for some number of years. And um, we put some money in the budget for this school year to begin the process of, of, of a study. And um, this past fall, we put out a request for um, in interviews with a number of architects and firms. We interviewed, I think, uh, groups of people from five or six um, relatively local and qualified architects and engineers. I mean, very impressive groups of people. And um, our committee, which was made up of, I believe, board members, a facilities director, administrators, uh, I, I don't know, it was quite a large group. We picked uh, this group um, to work with us to get a sense of what we're, we're facing. And um, it didn't take long to, 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 for us to kind of start pointing out the obvious things that we saw as problems. And um, the lady who just spoke, um, pointing some of those, those out, and there were uh, and there are, there are others, and we're going to hear about that tonight. So we um, moved along, and and the project I will say that we are talking about lately has gone beyond just purely safety issues, and and I think for the right reasons, I, I know for the right reasons, people will have said, the school board, town council. Um, and others that let's concentrate on the, uh, at least initially on just safety and let's get that right and um, and that's tonight what the presentation is on concentrating on 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 that issue and um, so I guess with that in, in mind is a, a lead in James you want to take it over from there 
Whatever you prefer. I think, uh, do we have a microphone there? Or? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Right. Oh, great. Um, I'm Kalen Colby with Colby Company Engineering. Uh, I have with me James Heber as a project manager. Seth, uh, Seth Wilschultz and Austin Smith from Scott Simons Architects are, are with us as well. Um, thank you for having us. Um, as Howard mentioned, we were selected last September. Um, not sure how much, uh, I wanted to sort of start, walk through where we've come since, since September and what the big picture is. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna present for a little while and then obviously we can open it up for questions. Next slide. So, Whenever, as architects and engineers, whenever we start, uh, start and I apologize if we didn't bring handouts, so you're gonna have to turn around and just take a quick look there. Um, <clears throat> whenever we um, start a project, um, we start back at what we call con conceptual stage. We gather information. There's a lot of listening going on. We, we meet with teachers. We meet with facilities engineers. We even meet with parents and students. And um, thank you. Um, we meet with your facilities folks all the time listening and gathering. And yes, we have a lot of design, um, design talent to bring to the table, but this isn't the time for that. This is the time to listen. Uh, we're in that phase right now. Um, you can see the red line that goes through the T and the E and T. Um, that's where we are right now in the process. We've just been selected. Um, Howard's had, had us meet with a few folks. We've listened. Uh, we've been hearing things from various folks. Um, we're still very much in the, in the uh, preliminary phases. Um, Howard, is it appropriate to go through the budget piece to, to sure. kind of ex extend? When we were selected in September, um, the Howard and the committee said, okay, how much does it cost to do a full-blown study for three schools? Um, I'll share the numbers with you. It's roughly $300,000. Um, they said, we don't have that much money in our budget. We'll have to wait until June of next year, uh, June of 18. That's this coming June. They had some money um, and they said, Howard and the committee said, hey, well, what can you do with this? We've got some issues we'd like you to address. It was perfect for us as designers because we love to have this eight months from that point on till June to study, to listen, to look at drawings, to gather, to gather materials. Um, and so I'm gonna skip ahead. I'm gonna go through the design process. I'll give you a quick timeline and then we're gonna dive in a little deeper. So after this first big, big uh, um, circle, go to the next one, which is schematic design and cost estimate. In a schematic design, you go to approximately 30% of the design. It allows you to get beyond the square foot cost um, and down into some real details where you can really truly start costing some, uh, some buildings. Um, so for example, an auditorium like this, you might say, well, we could build this for approximately $420 a square foot. That's back at the first square, at the first circle. At the schematic design, you'd actually have a size, you'd have some materials picked out, some general thoughts about the IT that might go into a room like this, and you begin to really get a, a better idea where that, excuse me, where that cost is. So that's schematic design. Design development takes that, <clears throat> takes that to a whole nother level where you go up to about 50 to 60% complete. And now we're actually showing some detail. We're showing how people are moving through it, how many folks can, can get through this building at one time. How will we heat it? Or how much green design? Can we have a solar panel? Can we have micro wind? Do we have micro hydro? All the wonderful things that can come with the building. What's the R value of the walls? Again, an updated cost estimate. And <clears throat> often, I don't know if you can see it, and I apologize, it's a little bit small, but all around these circles, you see the word listening. Every single time we're hearing, we're listening, we're listening to the industry, we're the materials of construction out there. How many folks were around for the EFIS on the brick in the school system in the 70s and 80s? I can't be the only one who's ever heard of EFIS. All the mold problems in schools? Oh, I guess I was the only one. <laughs> so after design development and cost estimate, we go to construction documents, and that's when you give the final blessing and say, this is the school we want to build, and these are the buildings we want to renovate, we actually put construction documents together that a contractor can actually bid. <clears throat> From that, we go to the bid cycle, and then we obviously go to construction and, and, uh, and help out the team do construction. So one more time, we're all the way back at the red line. All we're doing right now is listening. When somebody asks a question, we answer it to the best of our ability. We try to put general framework around things, and uh, we're looking forward to moving ahead. So again, one more piece of background before we go on. This is a really, really important slide. Um, Think about your homes, or if you're involved as a facilities engineer, like Perry back here, think about the buildings in your care. So on the, on the left-hand 
axis, you have building effectiveness. When you first build a brand spanking new building, you assume it's 100% effective. And then you can see all the way down here at the lower right is a building that's about 60 years old. Um, and that was a building that's already run its course, it's done. Um, it really needs to be renovated or perhaps even torn down and rebuilt. Um, Thank you. So our, um, I'll turn to Perry back here because he's the facilities engineer for your building. <laughs> it's Perry's job to make sure that we stay right on this line as the building degrades. If you're below this line down in here, you've neglected your building. You haven't, you haven't taken care of it. You haven't, uh, you're not keeping it up and the building's not going to last. And that's what this curve here shows a building that's only going to last about 20 years. If you're above the line, you don't want to be out here either because if you're above the line, you're over-investing in your building. There was no need perhaps to take out those boilers because they weren't at the end of their design life. And so that you can see the points on the curve we've got in here. You kind of come down and maybe after 15 years, you've got a boiler that needs to be upgraded. Come down, you've got um, reprogramming, some occupancy adjustments, some windows, some roof replacements as you come down. And basically, the blue line is the actual reality of what you're trying to, you know, what actually happens as you try to stay on this line. So <clears throat> as we have this time, this eight months between the time we were selected and the time to really start uh, full-blown studying and designing, um, the committee came forward and said, hey, we've got some safety issues. And we had already keyed in on it to uh, Seth and Austin from Simons had already, uh, Scott Simons had already identified the fact that when you walk into the building, you walk over 100 feet before you're addressed by a school administrator. And there were several other safety issues that were brought to the table. Right behind these, the, um, the safety issues, we call them uh, service life issues. And when we have a service life issue, that's something that we identify that should be on the line but isn't. Either it's over-invested and it's got a great life starting again, or it's, it has been neglected and we need to get it back up on the line. So we really focused on the safety and then we, through the listening process and just hearing what was going on, trying to identify the service life issues. Thanks, James. So preliminary findings. If you go all the way back to the report that was done in 2012 and 2013, that was six years ago. They had identified that you had window ceiling issues. They identified that you had some insulation issues, um, that the brick wasn't lasting because it wasn't being repointed. A lot of service life issues identified in that report. We did a quick tour around the building and realized that a lot of them hadn't, hadn't been kept up. Um, so those sort of, on the service life side, those went to the top of the list. Um, and then we've got these safety issues that kept, kept hounding us. <clears throat> um, So using the time, uh, the other thing that became important on the timeline is we got hired to do this study, if, and the study isn't going to start until June of this year at 18. A really good comprehensive study for three schools is going to take over a year to do, to really nail it. So then you're 2019, let's say you really want to get to construction and get something done. 2019. Then you're going to hire another architect and engineer. You're going to, they're going to take about anywhere from 12 to 15 months to design your, your new school. They're going to bid probably a three to four month bid cycle. You've got to match up the school uh, calendar with the availability of the buildings, with the seasons for construction, with your budget and timing. Um, if you do all that, you're looking at not starting anything, not having anything done until 2023. It's basically a five-year five window. What Howard and the committee asked us to do is say, hey, how can we speed that up? We've got these safety issues. We've, you know, we've got you on board to do this study. What can you do for us? So we came up with a plan, and I'm going to run through the schedule super quick. James is going to hit it for real later on. But the plan is get us started in June. We do that schematic design piece. We come around to next year. We have a bond that's ready. We've done 30% design, so we truly know what things cost, so you don't have a bid bust. You vote on the, you vote on the bond. We finish design, because by, by next June of, of uh, 19, we would not have finished design. We finished design that year, bid it, and as you, as you come into the spring season, April of 2020, you're actually building something, which is what we're proposing to do and what the committee has asked us to do. Um, it's three, full three years in advance of anything that uh, um, 
that we think could happen. So let's take a look at the, the building issues that we've uh, we identified. We've got safety concerns, which uh, James is going to address here in a little bit, at both the Pond Cove and the middle school. Code required generators. Um, the school, one of the schools doesn't have a generator. Um, and uh, it's needed. There's a lot of missed days already with the schools. <clears throat> Outdated IT uh, systems, what we heard from the folks in the school is there's places in the school where you actually can't get internet service and the internet service drops out and the PA system doesn't work really well and those are fine. None of those are anybody's fault. That's just a building that's 25 years old, infrastructure that's 25 years old, which is where you are. It's time to get back up on that line that I showed you. <clears throat> um, uh, outdated IT. Existing building systems and that's where we go to the windows, the doors, the heating systems getting it all back on the line, getting you set up for another 25 years of, uh, of building life. So. Gotcha. Thanks, Caleb. Hello, my name is James Hebert. I'm an electrical engineer, as well as the project manager for the team. And uh, again, thank you very much for having us here. I know it's a busy week for everyone, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Some of the things, again, speaking back to safety and security from an electrical and IT standpoint, uh, there are a lot of important items to keep in mind as you know we're entering the, as we are well into the 21st century, and things happen, and a lot of things change, and a lot of things that we wouldn't predict would happen 10, 20 years ago are happening now, and so it really brings it to a matter of security at our schools, security on our campus, uh, and security also in, in all the municipality, municipalities and buildings and even security for your home. So there are a lot of things that can be done. There is already an existing uh, video surveillance system in place at the, on the campus here at schools. We're looking to try to improve upon that. Uh, the, um, the fire department and the police department, EMS, are fortunately very nearby. So because of the fiber loop that's already underground already, uh, some of that can be tied into the fire to the police department so you can have sort of a live feed from all the video cameras in the school feed into you know watching at the police station and these don't have to be for um, uh, it, it can be for any kind of event uh, there's a student that may collapse in a cafeteria due to a peanut allergy or a teacher has a heart attack and collapses in the hallway where no one can see this person but someone might be able to spot that on a camera and really just try to um, you know mitigate any potential crisis or problem that could happen especially you know it's not just an intruder into the school like I said it could be a student or it could be a teacher um, Digital security alarms for all entrances and exits. Uh, there have been a lot of improvements in the technology over the last 20 or so years. It really makes it easy to uh, install these systems and make them easy to uh, learn by faculty and staff and maintain as well. Um, there's also panic and duress buttons for classrooms and staff. A lot of that has been installed in a lot of schools already. It's as simple as a button at a desk or a button on a, on a keychain that someone can use and walk around with. Uh, mass notification and emergency communication, um, a lot of our experience with a lot of facilities that we do deals with mass notification. There's an ability for someone during an emergency event or a fire event, they can walk up to uh, a fire alarm control panel or another enunciating control panel, grab the phone and make an announcement or a pre-programmed announcement that can be broadcast throughout the entire school or schools on the campus because um, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, the good bones of the uh, IT infrastructure, everything is connected here, which is great. Uh, additionally, preparing an operations and maintenance plan for you folks is very important. Scheduled testing, making sure that all of the PAs work, making sure all the cameras work, making sure all the digital locks and doors work. Um, and we would help create that O&M manual to give to Perry. And uh, sorry, I'm creating more work for you, Perry. <laughs> um, the, uh, we, can, uh, we can create these manuals and operating guides to uh, help maintain the system, again, keeping yourselves along that maintenance curve and not letting anything degrade over time. Um, also, remote unlock for school lockdowns. Um, that's that's a, a lot of things where if you're at the entry of a building, you can see from a far away distance um, if there's someone coming who shouldn't be there and you can lock the doors. Additionally, reinforce classroom doors as well. Uh, you know, it's not just at the front entrance of the building that uh, you want to make sure everyone is safe. Uh, it goes right down to each individual classroom. And uh, speaking with like a reinforced door frame and a reinforced door that really causes a deterrence for someone to really try to get into that door and slow them down or stop them. 
uh, electronic key training or card access. Uh, again, there is a card system already in place, but we want to make sure that every door, every door or point of access in the building has that ability to be swiped through and then traced to see who's actually coming in there. And I mentioned deterrent, and that's really what you want to be, what you want to create here. If you can create a deterrent that people know that they're going to have to go through a substantial amount of, uh, of resistance before actually getting into the building, um, that level of deterrence um, is what you really want. And I'll take the next slide, please. So speaking generally, again, from electrical sy systems, uh, there's, no back on, there's no backup generator on site for the Pond Cove or um, Middle School at its current time. There was a bid in the past. Uh, that when wanted to place one actually in the very location that we call out as well. So it's a very good location. There's a transformer from the utility that comes right in uh, into the building. The electrical room is right there. Um, the plot of, literally the plot of land was, was meant to have it generated in that location. And based upon um, the recent weather events and downed trees and uh, aside from the major storm events, there are other issues with losing power within the town. Um, I grew up in Gorham, so we suffered, the, we suffered a lot of the same sort of weather patterns that you folks have out here where someone strikes a tree and the tree goes down and wipes out the lines and everyone on the street is losing power. There's no storm event. The city or the town is still functioning, everything's still going on, but we don't have power and potentially if it's on the line that the school is on, the school doesn't have power either. Uh, so a generator can be there just to keep uh, it can either just keep the lights running and keep the systems from, uh, keep your water pipes from freezing, keep the heat going, or keep the cooling going. You can still have a limited, uh, um, a limited, depending on what the size of the generator is, you can still hold full classes during the day or may have to make some adjustments, you know, if, if we do lose power or internet. Um, and uh, I'll jump to the next slide, please. So referring to the, to the IT systems, um, there is an underground fiber optic network that goes around the campus and we're going to be looking at that to see if that can be upgraded to um, see just kind of what, what sort of advantages we can have by upgrading fiber optic cable. A lot of this was put in 15, 20 years ago and as sure as all you know, nobody keeps a laptop that long, um, not even five years anymore. So a lot, just similar to your phone, similar to your computer at home, these are internet um, these are internet piece based pieces of equipment that have to be upgraded and maintained. Uh, the IT system, the IT closet in the middle school and the Pond Cove school, and they both share this as you all know, uh, it's located next to some domestic hot water, hot water and cold water valves which really is a big no-no when you're talking about electricity and uh, electrical systems. Uh, at any point that valve could fail and due to, and speaking with Noel Haroff and some of his staff, um, because this is tied into the rest of the municipal fiber loop, there's a poten potential chance that this could affect other municipal systems as well inter that are internet related. Um, because essentially the fiber loop comes into here and then goes and touches the library and the fire station and some other places on the campus. Um, so what we're proposing to do, yeah, so these are sort of the challenges in place right now. A lot of the wires need to be done. They need to be taken out and rewired, put organized in the cable trays, run along the ceilings. A lot of this is older Cat 3 or Cat 4, and we're now at the Category 6, which is just basically a more upgraded version of the internet, um, the internet wires going to the classrooms. Um, we can jump to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and in the classrooms, as Kaylin has said, the signal starts to degrade after 250 feet where we have classrooms that are at almost 300 feet from the main, from the main uh, IT room. And we want to make sure that you know, everybody has a cell phone now, everybody has a laptop now. A lot of these you know, point to point piece, uh, pieces of equipment that you know, our children have in these schools, they need to have access to them. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a program that's used in place to help track students during an assembly or during a fire alarm or an evacuation. And you want to make sure that you have sort of Wi-Fi or internet connectivity throughout your campus here for all the schools. And that's what really brings us to this slide here. So you can see the middle school and the Pond Cove school here and the middle right and the high school here is in the middle left. Um, each of the parking lots right now I have sort of highlighted and we can provide, we'll provide a digital copy of this presentation. This is a modified one from the one we gave to the school board workshop in January. Um, but we want to have uh, Wi-Fi um, or internet connectivity to the school network at all of these parking lot locations because a lot of them are designated for 
students to assemble after a fire alarm evacuation or just leaving the school. And that way they can use their phones, the school devices that are typically Wi-Fi only can connect to the network and teachers can say, you know, the student is here and the student is here, or I grabbed this student because we were evacuating the school during this drill, so I have a, him or her here, so it's okay, we're all accounted for. Um, and this is sort of, you know, easier things that can be accomplished now with a lot, a lot of the technology that's out there. So we want to replace the outdated equipment. We want to provide dedicated spaces for IT equipment. Um, when the school was built back in, well, at least a, a large portion of the school was built back in 1994 and a lot of it earlier, um, who would have thought 20, 30 years down the road that you know every student in the school would have an iPhone? I mean, I certainly wouldn't have. Um, and having all those devices that are downloading books, textbooks, videos, uh, instructional material, those, that all takes bandwidth. And uh, as we all know, we're paying our cable bills. We can pay for the baseline or the higher line or more data, and it's, more, it's all about more data, right? And so it's the same thing for a school. You have several hundred students trying to download this information. Well, that weighs down your bandwidth significantly. So that's an IT infrastructure upgrade, just to upgrade all the cables, upgrade all the data drops in the room, provide more wireless hotspots for all the students to connect everything to. And, uh, and also, one thing as well, when in 1994, they, they added a few, one drive, it was one drop in each room. And right now, the because of the requirements of a lot of the equipment that's in there now, we need three to four data drops basically plug in into the wall. Even though everything, like as I said, moving more towards Wi-Fi and wireless, you still have devices in your room like printers, computers, uh, voice over internet telephones that still need to have a hard wired access. Because that's, that's all from the IT perspective. And um, I can jump ahead to uh, the next one, please. So we're going to go over to the cafeteria and the auditorium. And uh, Austin here is going to uh, take us away. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, I'm Austin Smith with Scott Simons Architects. And as Kaylin mentioned, uh, you know, our fee was not in place. We had a very small fee to start with. And aside from the safety issues, we met with the committee, and they identified some target issues for us to do some initial investigation, some concept level investigations. And one of the topics we heard uh, day one from our interviews in August of 2017 was the cafetorium. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the cafetorium. Cafetoriums were a very popular approach in the 80s and in the early 90s. And it's a shared space between an auditorium and a cafeteria. And what happened is that uh, it had uh, a design capacity, and the number of students has exceeded that design capacity. It's a shared space not only between the cafeteria and auditorium, but between the middle school and the lower school. And uh, another um, thing that happened is that the nature of the kitchen changed. Uh, the kitchen, going from a single serving line, became uh, um, state-mandated salad bars and delis and point of sales. So that kitchen start encroaching upon the actual uh, seating space. Uh, and as you know, too, uh, the uh, cafeteria actually steps and floors um, to serve as risers for the performance space. And um, the consequence of this is that the middle school has two seatings of 20 minutes each, and the lower school has three seatings of 25 minutes each. So there are five different seatings for a lunch between the middle school and the lower school. And that extends that lunch period, shortens it for the students, but extends it uh, for the whole schools. And as a performance space, it's lacking as well. The risers that I mentioned are not adequate to provide really ideal sight lines. Uh, there are not enough support space, such as green rooms and dressing rooms, proper lighting, uh, control booth, and acoustics. So it really does not work well as both a cafeteria and as a performance space. Um, and um, next slide, please. Another shortcoming of it is that the cafeteria, which is right here, is actually serviced from this point, so that all the food has to cross paths with students and teachers, and that door has to be carefully monitored and buzzed in with each and every shipment coming through the school, and again, it goes down a hallway um, shared with the students. And then this is also a slide that was touched upon earlier, the major security issues. This is the entry point to the middle school, and this is the staff area. 
So there is the ability to buzz people in, but you're not confronted with a staff member until you've passed the uh, cafeteria and the uh, auditorium filled with students. Um, so that's a significant safety issue. The ideal situation would be to be buzzed in, directly confronted with a staff member, and then buzzed in again. And this condition not only exists for the middle school, it exists for the lower school as well. Someone is buzzed in here, the staff office is here, and a visitor passes by the gymnasium filled with kids. And that's, as everyone knows, is less than ideal. Hello, I'm Seth with Scott Simons Architects. And as Austin uh, pointed out, all of these issues, we've tried to identify some target solutions. We're, again, just in the beginning stages. You can see from this plan on the screen that it's just block level spaces that indicate a square footage. These have been vetted by a kitchen consultant, by an auditorium seating consultant, but they're not designed spaces yet. That would all take place uh, after June. But to address the security issue, we are proposing a new addition on the front side of the school that would have a new double entry system like Austin described, one for the middle school, one for the lower school, and then relocating a bunch of the offices uh, in both the, little, the lower school and the middle school into the central core. So you have direct observation of people coming and going, and the administrative staff is right by the entrances. Then when we started examining how to renovate both the cafeteria and the auditorium. It quickly became evident that the cafeteria couldn't be renovated at its current size. It really needed to be quite a bit bigger. Also, we have to overlap how construction works with your school schedule. We do not have enough time in the summer to take the cafeteria offline, renovate the space, expand it, install all the new equipment, and open for the following school year. That just is not feasible for construction. So we thought we'd best if we could uh, identify a phase approach. We can build a new cafeteria space somewhere where the existing cafeteria is not. You can continue to use your cafeteria day in and day out. And then when the new one's online, you can then take any equipment we want to repurpose out of the old one, supplant it with any new equipment, get the new one operational, preferably over a summer, and then you can take the old one offline and renovate that space into uh, the new auditorium. So we looked at a number of locations for that addition and uh, through feedback with the school principals, Howard, Catherine, and um, the building committee, uh, the one that we have landed on as a recommendation is building an addition in the current courtyard. It has a number of advantages. Again, we can do a phase construction. We can start construction on the new cafeteria while the existing one continues to service the students. It allows us access from both the middle school and the lower school. I know it's a little hard to read. We are proposing two separate dining rooms, not one combined, one for the middle school here, and one for the lower school down here, attached to the lower school and the middle school respectively, with a combined kitchen and separate serving lines. These are sized to allow the middle school to either do one or two lunches. That would be up to the school board, the president, um, sorry, the uh, principal of the school, and uh, staffing issues to figure out how you wanted to schedule and run uh, those lunches. And then the lower school, we heard from the uh, lower school principal that he wanted actually smaller groups, so more seatings of smaller groups. So we're proposing a double loaded cafeteria that you can serve two groups at the same time. So we could take the, the three groups that you currently have and do two seatings of two groups of about 110 each uh, so that there's less serving for the kitchen staff but smaller groups for the students because these are smaller kids. We have a dedicated service kitchen service line over here, which again gets us out of having to bring, as Austin noted, having to bring all the uh, incoming food and outgoing trash through this corridor to this back entrance over here. So we have a direct entrance. And it creates this really uh, amazing space, or potentially amazing space, an outdoor courtyard. That could be an outdoor overflow for the seating in the cafeteria if it's nice weather. It could also be outdoor classroom space because it's protected. It's not uh, open to the uh, street as the current courtyard is. We have a nice protected space and it could really be a wonderful space for a number of events. And then once all of that was operational, we could renovate the existing cafetorium and do a, a standalone auditorium. Well, we've done a study that we can fit about 600 to 650 fixed seats in that space with a proper rise, a new thrust stage, new dressing rooms, green room, uh, control booth, and some uh, 
kind of uh, support spaces to make it a really functional auditorium. That could be a space that is also used by the community. Uh, you know, we have a direct access here from the outside, so it could be a space that is used after hours by the community as well. And Seth made a great point about having this avail available for the community because, uh, again, you mentioned, uh, can we go back to one slide real quick? Um, you can enter through here, but you can also seal off portions of the building by the double doors down here that are already in place in the school. So you can really isolate this area if you wanted to run it after school hours or have an event there that was open to the community. Okay, we can skip ahead now. Thank you. So the path forward. And uh, what we've been discussing the last several months is sort of how, how we're moving forward with this project, how we're moving through forward with the ideas that were given to us that we wanted to go through with. Um, as is proposed now, in May, prior to Memorial Day, we want to, we want to meet with the faculty and staff from all the three schools. Um, again, this goes back to uh, one of our earlier slides with Kalen where he said, you know, listening is part of every single step of this process. Uh, transparency is as well. And our goal is to make sure that every voice is heard. Um, so by in May, we want to meet with the faculty and staff of each of the three schools and, and identify, you know, what are the big what are the big items that they see on the day-to-day -day basis in the classrooms uh, with the students. Um, and then in July uh, 2018, um, the field investigations would begin. Uh, field investigations in the beginning of our, our limited uh, schematic design level. Um, Kalen will, will discuss a little bit further the sort of the how we arrive at this budgetarily, uh, if that's a word, um, as we go forward into this. Um, the, uh, the field investigations would begin in July. We would prepare a, a level of drawings and conceptual designs uh, how, large enough to be bid and to have that bond size appropriately to encapsulate all of the projects that are being proposed. And one thing to note too that uh, this is still very preliminary. Everything is very preliminary right now. As we saw in the earlier slide, that red line that we are at, we are only 3% into this whole process, if that. Um, this is the data gather. This is the data gathering stage. This is our point where we ask the questions and we listen. And coming to events like this, where we get to hear comments from the uh, from the people who live here, like Catherine. Thank you very much for mentioning that earlier. Really appreciate that. Um, it's it's good for us to hear from the, one the folks who work here, two the folks who govern here, and three the folks who also live here. And those things are very important for us. So as we go through, uh, as we go forward, and understanding the budget issues that we have, we have proposed a limited um, a limited schematic design based uh, off of our initial. Uh, proposals that we had clearly too high, so what can we do, what can we give you as far as keeping the process moving forward and keeping the project moving forward while keeping an eye on that uh, spring, late spring, early summer of 2020 as a build date to give you a shovel in the ground. Um, so again, as I said, July 2018, that's when we push, uh, that's when we push the first ceiling tile above the ceiling. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, because of the limited budget of this fiscal year, we were only able to sort of go after these uh, specific projects that we were asked to take a look at. Um, and as we go through and we pop open ceiling tiles, we see what's in there. We take a look at the HVAC equipment that's been running for maybe 20 or 30 years. We identify items that, one, need to be addressed immediately, two, items that, need to, that could be addressed in maybe five to 10 years, and then items, well, this is okay, you don't really need to worry about this for a while. Um, and now we can jump to the next slide, please. So right here, and as I said, we'll make this available for everyone afterwards, but this is just a basic Gantt chart of the project schedule. This was also available at the, uh, in the January um, school board workshop as well. Uh, and there are four important dates here that we want uh, you folks to come away with. Uh, one, is the, uh, one is the town budget approval on June 2018. That sort of starts the process of uh, getting us into these schools in July. Uh, from July up until um, even past, past December and into next spring, we're going to be going through asking the questions, meeting with folks who work here, uh, again, pushing up ceiling tiles, looking under things, making sure that everything, one, is code compliant or if needs to be addressed, two items and um, everything is still safe infrastructure wise and we make note of those and throughout that process we're meeting with the group from you folks from Cape Elizabeth helping us make the decisions because ultimately um, we are just one cog on this team 
and uh, everybody has equal representation here. We're not the group that's sort of driving forward and leaving, leading everything. Uh, this is a team effort, and we one thing we uh, pride ourselves on is that we know our place on the team. Um, the second uh, important date here is the town bond vote, and that's, that'll be June of 2019. Now, by this point, we come to June 2019 after doing all of this field inve investigations, all of this work, um, having public, public meetings with you folks, keeping you updated. Uh, June 2019 is when the bond is sized to encapsulate the entire project. Now, the, cons now the, the work that we do from July until probably December, January, depending how long your bond process takes to uh, put together, um, you will have the number that will be able to size the bond accurately to carry forward. The third, um, the third uh, important date here is the design completion. So assuming the, bond, the town bond passes in June of 2019, the design would be complete by December 2019. So we would take that remaining, that first half of the 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year to one, finish the schematic design that we started uh, in Ju July of 2018. So we will finish that. We will carry forward with the construction document, construction level documents for bid. And as soon as we turn over the construction documents to you folks, with it will also be a feasibility study that will be complete and updated with all of the projects that we are addressing as part of this, uh, as part of this project. That way you have the most up-to-date feasibility schedule that you can possibly have inside of it, um, giving a, sort of a listed priority of this system we found is suitable. It can work for another five to eight years. You don't need to look at this for a while, but you will need to look at it in maybe 2024 or 2025. And um, we have a lot of experience providing these sort of uh, building assessment projects, and we, and we will give you that as part of the uh, feasibility report, prioritizing future projects for you to sort of keep on your radar as you go forward. And I'll say the last uh, most important um, uh, uh, date on here is the start of construction. So that'll be April 2020, unless we have a winter like this one. Um, basically, weather permitting, the, bond pro the bid process starts in January. It takes three to four months or so to identify the contractors, interview them. They look at the documents. They send questions back to us, the designers, asking, what did you mean by this? Um, the town will then select a contractor to work with and build. And based on a construction sequence that Seth alluded to earlier, basically, what can we build right away while the students are still in session? Sort of the big ticket items that will stop school, you wait for the summertime. But sequencing all of the projects where, well, we can build this while the school is still in session and really reduce and mitigate the disruptions as much as we can. Um, so those are the four, four important dates that we have. Um, and we understand this is a very public process. Uh, and we want to keep the public involved and everyone involved the entire way. And again, we're always more than happy to answer questions at any time. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Kaylin real quick. Thank you. Some folks might ask, is it, is, is it too early to start talking about money? And I think if you're talking about design or anything we do at our homes anytime along the way, it's never too late to ask a question or too early to talk about money. Um, as James said, we're less than 3% of the way through this. Um, we did, um, as, a, as a team, <clears throat> um, under Howard's direction, address some issues. And anytime you address an issue, we sort of put our, try to bracket the solution. That's what we do as engineers. We bracket the solution and sort of came up with a notional budget of what this might look like. Um, along the way, we've talked about, well, do we actually need a bond? You know, is the bond the way to go? Should we try to fund these as we go along? I'm a taxpayer in town, and uh, you know, do we want to see that just come up every year? Hey, we're going to have to invest several hundred thousand or, or several million dollars every single year, or do we package it up as a bond? Um, those are still very good questions, and we're going to keep poking that as we go along. But you've got a school that's school system roughly 24 years old since its last major renovation. Um, it is not much was done out of the 2013 2012 report. So there's been another six years of degradation of the service life on things. Um, we got some fairly serious safety and security issues that you need to address. And um, you start looking at the numbers and it starts, starts to look notionally about like this. Um, one thing you always get in trouble with is throwing out a number early on in a project. 
Um, if this balloons up to 40 or goes back down to 15, we don't know. We haven't pushed up a ceiling tile yet. But notionally, these are the kind of things we're talking about, and they sort of, they sort of roll in around that $27 million mark. Um, and so that's sort of, sort of where we are. If I can you go back to, the, to the, the slide of the, <clears throat> there we go. I keep coming back to this slide because I, it's, I'm an engineer and I have a huge comfort in this slide. Um, is this is, again, these buildings, it's infrastructure. They're no different than our homes. When the roof goes out on your home, when the boiler goes out on your home, when your windows get old, when it looks like you should insulate or change fuel systems from oil to natural gas or whatever, all you're doing is putting your home back on the curve. If you dump too much money into your home, it's just wasted. You'll never actually get it back, right? You make your home too big, you can't get that money back, you're now above the curve. You neglect your home, you're down below the curve. Our job as engineers and architects is to one, make this building safe, but two, to keep you on that curve for the rest of the life of this structure. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take questions now? Um, yeah, so I think we'll start with the town council first. Um, town council members, um, this would be a great time for you if you have questions to ask directly to us or to the partners. Um, <coughs> Yeah, Jamie. Thanks. Um, thanks for having the meeting tonight. Uh, thank you all for being here. Appreciate your time and going through all that. Um, either James or Kaylin, I'm not sure which of you is the best to answer. Um, can you advance one or two slides? I think it was, yeah, right, let's start here. Uh, oh no, one more, sorry. Yeah, there. Can, could you go into a little bit more detail for us um, about how whether if a community was building a new school or for many of our surrounding and neighboring communities that are probably um, you know facilities that are roughly the same age as ours and things like that can you just go into a little bit more detail around how much these items are now sort of standard process Thank you for asking the question. I'm more than happy to answer. Just give me one moment. So as building codes are being upgraded, um, revised, added to, uh, you're really seeing a lot more of, especially in municipal buildings and government buildings as well, you're seeing a lot more video surveillance, video monitoring and the remote lock and unlock, not only for a lockdown of buildings, but also for access to restricted spaces and just access into the buildings in general. Um, a lot more, you're, you're gonna see everyone similar to a hospital where you have a key card, where you won't be able to get past these double doors if they're closed, unless you have a key card. Similarly, when, uh, I'll give another example, so we have a fire alarm. When the fire alarm triggers, a lot of the fire doors will just automatically close. So that's the magnetic lock that's at the top of the door. And when the fire alarm trips, that sends a small electrical signal to just sort of demagnetize the lock so it closes the doors to help contain a fire whenever there's a fire event. Uh, and these instances are being adapted and utilized in buildings, not just for fire, but again, for, for security and lockdown. Uh, another thing that we're seeing a lot more of, and Austin had touched upon this and Seth as well, is that the, um, um, the reinforced entry into spaces where you open a door, someone buzzes you into opening the door, closes the door, and now you're inside of sort of an entryway where you turn to the right or you turn to the left and you see folks there who say, hi, how are you, please sign in, who are you here to see, we'll give them a call. Uh, and once, that's, once that sort of level of control and uh, confirmation is made, then they're given their visitor badge and they're passed on, or someone has come to meet them, to escort them to the next location or where they're going to go. Um, and we've, as far as, uh, with regard to government projects, we have a lot of experience with, we're seeing a lot more of that, where government agencies are requiring um, physical access security to access the space and get in and also get out of it. Does that sort of answer your question? Yep, and I also, oh, Austin. Sure, yeah. So one of our first starting points is reference to state standards, and we have copies of those, their references, uh, their suggestions for security, 
I can tell you they're completely obsolete now. You know, our world has changed so much in the last year that that single security point is no longer adequate. We need to think 10 years down the line. So that's where we are. Um, and then, could I ask a follow-up? Oh, sure. um, I, I don't know, Matt, if this is for you or for Perry, and I, I don't expect that you'd have the information off the top of your head or anything, but um, with some of these things, would the town um, get better pricing on insurance, better coverage, anything like that that would be advantageous um, from that perspective? Is that something that you either know or might be able to look into? It would be something I'm going to have to look into, but it's, uh, but it's worth, worth asking the question. Okay. Sure. Jessica. I have a question for Mr. Smith. Um, when you were reviewing the, the proposed changes to the middle school um, cafeteria, cafetorium, you mentioned that it has exceeded its design capacity num for number of students. What was that number of students capacity for which it was originally built? Sorry, could you repeat that? They both have over 550 students total. Now, the right. lower school uh, principal has noted he doesn't want one seating of 500 plus lower school students because that's a lot of really little kids. <laughs> so we, we are proposing to uh, do one lower school lunch. Uh, we are proposing to give the school administrators better flexibility in how they study. The kitchen staff only has 10 minutes to do a turnover, uh, and so their day is really long. And then what we heard from their staff is that on Fridays, they're forced to use uh, uh, disposable utensils because, and plates and everything because they don't have time to do the breakdown and the cleanup at the end of the week. So on Fridays, it's just a throwaway. And so what we're trying to do is balance both the desire for smaller, more smaller groups for the lower school, bigger, possibly one group for the middle school, and shorten the number of servings kind of all at once. So you're saying that the, the original size of the cafeteria area when it was to be used as a cafeteria, I know it's a combo cafeteria, cafetorium, <clears throat> the original space that was to be available for children to eat was over time encroached upon by uh, by the by sales locations for those, and, and as Austin pointed out, um, the checkout locations are in this space. And as Austin pointed out, the school lunches have changed. There are now state mandated options. And so it's hard, it's hard to see in this photograph, I apologize. But um, over here, there's a, there's a, a station of a, a salad bar. And over right. here, there's a station for sandwiches. And then there's two point of sale stations in the middle and the staff says that that's not enough to keep people moving through. 
So this it, whole first roughly 1,000 square feet, you know, maybe 15 feet wide off this wall, has all been consumed by the process of getting the food to the children. Yes. Okay, so it's not an actual expansion of the kitchen per se, but the addition of other things like food stations that are mandated, da, 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 that are out in this area because they can't be anywhere else, I guess? Okay, thank you. May, may I speak to this? Um, I, I um, just want to say that I think that the lunchtime is an important part of a child's day. And I think that it's um, a time to, first of all, to just relax and, and to um, enjoy your food and to have um, conversation with your friends. Our, our lunch program at Pond Cove in the middle school, that, I did not just describe that. Um, it, if you, if you uh, um, have not seen the way that it works, I, I seriously mean it. We would love to invite you over and have you witness it. I'd like you to stay for the whole thing, though. Uh, don't just pop in and, and, and then leave. Stick around for about a couple hours and watch the workers, how fast they're working, how hard they're working. Watch the kids be moved in, moved out. The noise level is um, unbelievable. It's, 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 it's not what we want. And we have um, talked a lot in our district here about the importance of, of, um, of, of wellness. And I, I, I really think that if you um, had a, uh, what, we, what we provide every day to hundreds of children is not healthy. And it's not a good model for them about the way that they should, should uh, eat, how they should interact, how they should relax. These are really important things. And I just want to reiterate what Seth said. It really sequences well that, you know, you have no downtime. It allows you to build a new cafeteria without any um, disruption to the school program. And in the end, you still end up with the benefit of having one kitchen that serves both the middle school and the lower school. So you keep that efficiency that you have currently. Sorry? Yeah, sure. Can I ask a question to help again? Oh, sure. So, what time does middle school start lunch? Or what's the earliest lunch time? Um, Mr. Uh, Eastman. It's about 10.45. 10.45. I know. It's not right. No, it's not right. And also, I know we've been sick since February in my house. We haven't stopped being sick. Do the kids get to wash their hands before they eat lunch? I, I don't know. Do they have children? Yeah, it's not in the cafeteria area, so we have to be on their own. Uh, and how about at the elementary school? Often, no. <laughs> Chris? Uh, so I wanted to add a little color. This isn't really going to be questions, it's more going to be points. A little color to what Howard said. Um, my children, what they report back to me is with those 20 minute periods that you mentioned for the middle school, that's the entire time that's allocated. That includes the time they have to spend waiting in line if they try to buy a hot lunch. So the actual time they have to eat is even less than that which actually dissuades them from ever buying a hot lunch. Because they say, I don't have enough time to eat if I actually mm -hmm. try to buy a hot lunch. Mm -hmm. So factor that in with that time. That includes the time waiting in line in order to buy food. Uh, the other point, uh, you mentioned too soon to talk numbers. I just want to add a little more color to a point I made the other day, which was in response to something that John Boltz made that I found incredibly persuasive. And that's just taking Ponco, just taking the Ponco proposal of 7.5 million, the low end number of just the Ponco uh, portion of your table. If I did my math right, 7.5 million, uh, there's something called basis points. It's a way of looking at how much interest rates change. The basis points on a 20 year treasury bond has changed almost half a percent just since the beginning of the year. That change alone, the difference uh, over the lifetime of this bond, because we're talking such a large amount of money of millions of dollars, that alone is about a $1.6 million swing in your interest payments. If it goes up another half a percent, we're looking at over $3 million in interest that we're paying simply by delaying. So right now we're in an incredibly low interest rate period. We've gone up on the 20-year bond a little under half a percent in the last couple months. If we continue to go up, we, it, if the town decides this is something they want to do, this is something we should lock in that rate as soon as we can. So those are my Can I just uh, look forward to the people? 
I don't want to dwell on numbers. I just want to make sure that, that we don't uh, get an idea of a number in our head. And, we, and I know you're just picking a number. But just, but just so everyone knows, right, we have top, we have above the line numbers, which are construction numbers. These are the numbers you pay to a contractor to physically do the work, right? And then we have below the line numbers, right, which I realize are a little bit blurry on this screen. One of them says kitchen equipment, which is between a million and a million two, right? One of them says soft costs. Soft costs include everything from permitting to the design fees to there are a number of testing requirements that an owner has to partake. All those numbers are rolled into design costs and they can, they can easily be about 20%. So when we're talking our numbers, we, it, um, it can get really confusing if you're talking kind of construction costs or whole project costs. I just want to make sure that people latch on to the whole project costs, the below the line numbers. However, these are multipliers. So of course, whatever is in the top half is multiplied by the 20%. So as the top part changes, the bottom part changes too. And I know you weren't picking that number, but just making sure we're focusing on the right number. Um, I think it was Austin that might have been making a point about the waste with the Friday service, or Seth, sorry. Um, I had a question that involved that and some other, so I know that it, on a, for at least two days this year, we've had school closures because of the, the power failure, correct? Three. It, three? Okay. So, I'm, and again, I don't expect any of you to have this answer. It might be a question for Mr. Esposito or Catherine might through him know that, but I'm just curious about how much loss there's been based on our inability to maintain operations. And combined with that, the point being made about on 36 days out of the calendar, school calendar year, we're using disposable things that I assume that there's a cost associated with beyond what is our standard offer? I'm just curious, with this, it sounds like there's potential for cost savings on your operating costs based on lack of loss. Is that accurate? Well, certainly you could, certainly you could do a, a payoff alone on the generator. You know, if you assume X number of lost school days in a year, the generator is only 300 something thousand dollars. You know, I can't imagine it would take that long to pay itself off. A lot of the cost of the generator is that it's precisely what Seth said. You take the money that you potentially lose on losing a day of school, or not only, you know, it's hard to calculate that number because you also have to calculate the number of the time, right, the number for money of the time that parents have to take out of work to stop work, take a day off from work, have an extra day of daycare. Um, that's also, I mean, an almost an uncalculable. Just maybe with a food loss um, from those days, I mean, that might just give us a place to start looking at a hard number. Right. Valerie? Oh, this microphone. So, um, we had a citizen come forward with some concerns about um, the way that the schools were being managed, the way that funds were being managed. So in the interest of providing a little more information to the citizens, um, I can't recall which one of you noted that there were some items that were identified um, earlier in an earlier study that needed to be addressed and that those still hadn't been addressed. Do you have a, a list of those items or could you run through what some of those are? I don't have a complete list for you, but I can run down the basics. Um, as part of the complete study, we're obviously going to take apart that 2012-2013 study, identify everything, find out has it been addressed uh, in some fashion, how much was it addressed. Um, just to give you an example of that before I get into the list is um, brick sealing. Uh, for those of you with a brick home, you know that every so often you need to waterproof your brick from the outside um, <clears throat> so it doesn't absorb water. Um, so the report said, hey, you need to do some brick sealing. There may have been some, you know, and may have, uh, oftentimes you do, you have a little money left over in your budget at the end of the year, so we'll do the south wall, because the sun hits it and degrades it. Uh, bless you. Um, 
and then they'll do the north wall. So we don't know how much brick ceiling. We don't believe there's any, any has been done. Um, just to give you a list of some of the things that are in the report, um, they, they identified that the windows and the caulking around the windows was, was breaking down. Um, I'm guessing that in the last six years, somebody has gone around the school with some amount of caulking to help this because they mentioned that there was water intrusion. intrusion. Um, so obviously we need to go back and check that entire, um, again, the ceiling of the brick. Um, for us, the, uh, the roof, the roof to wall pair, where the, where the parapet, where your roof comes up over, that flashing detail is incredibly important to go back through. It talked about door and window replacement. We don't know how many doors or windows have been replaced. Um, and again, um, these, again, think of, think of your own home, is when do you replace that door? When do you replace that window? Um, this is nobody's fault. Things get old. Everything we build, nature starts to take apart. And so you've got a building now that's 24 years old um, and buildings wear down. There's hundreds and thousands of folks running through this building. Think about the, think about the carpet in your home where it's worn or the tile in your entryway where it's worn just from a family of four or six people walking on it and dragging in some dirt every day. Now think about a school where thousands of people, kids a week and parents come rolling through. Drywall gets damaged, tile gets worn down, carpet gets worn down, it, it happens. Um, there were the usual things, ceiling tiles that were, were stained and need to be done, um, uh, upgrades to lighting. Um, those are some, do you have any, have I missed any big ones? ADA. Uh, the ADA compliance, uh, again, we don't know what's been done with respect to um, not just ramps, but getting into bathrooms in the space so that um, somebody who's wheelchair bound and have space to move around inside and space to get into a classroom, thresholds at all the doors to make sure um, changes in elevation are either one floor to another. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact list because we haven't really started to break it down. Pretty soon you're going to have to, you're going to be sitting here one night and it'll be a whole Excel spreadsheet and we're going to have to serve you coffee to keep you awake through it. So. <laughs> Well, to, to add to that question from Councilor Randall, I mean, this is, this is a big concern, um, and I'm wondering at what point you might be able to point out those things, because there has been uh, a capital improvement plan and um, that was created and started five years ago. <clears throat> and so there certainly are a number of citizens very interested in getting, you know, a full update on that. Um, we have had just had some update on that. But looking at that and versus looking at, you know, a large bond package for things that, you know, were they already done, were they not done and paid for, that sort of right. thing. So that <clears throat> going forward, that would be, I think, a very important thing to uh, study carefully. No, you're uh, exactly right. I We've got, we're presently um, working with Howard and the team to begin to talk to the teachers in, in, uh, in May. And then when, as soon as school lets out, we'll be in pushing up ceiling tiles and crawling through the basements and, and, and walkways and, and basically measuring everything we can. Before we actually get in to do that portion, we'll have the list from the report because that's the, that's the foundation from where, which we start. We'll have existing drawings and a breakdown from the, uh, from the previous report. And do you have a time frame on when that would be a deliverable? I, well, it'd be before June, before we go in. Before June? Sometime in June. The uh, June of this year, do you mean? Or? Yes, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Forgive me, uh, the field investigation starts in July, but the list would be done probably by the end of June going in, before we go into the building. Um, but I think maybe the best time to look at that would be after we've done about a month's worth of work in the school, a minimum of a month's worth of work, getting in there so we can show you, here's what the report identified, here's what's been done. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data to go through. Every time, um, I'll look back at Perry, even though he hasn't been here that long. Every time the school issues a repair, just to notice like uh, water's coming in, so they get a contractor to come in and they decide to replace a window. Well, that particular window may still have a 15 year life, so we need to identify it on the drawings so that it doesn't get replaced if we're gonna recommend a window replacement. Basically, all year long, every time something's gone wrong and you issued a $5,000 to a contractor to come fix it, or 1,500 or 800, all those things need to be gone through in addition to that report. There's a, there's a mountain of data to, to, to be had here. But it is a deliverable from us to you. So, 
So ju just a word a little bit on, on, on process from uh, the capital improvement plan list that you've seen before. So what happens basically, and it's happened every year that I've been around the school board, is those list of capital projects get restacked every year. Because some things are now urgent, some things you thought were urgent are less urgent, some things you thought you might need to replace the whole thing, you can get by with replacing less of it. So the, those are all reevaluated and restacked every year, and then the top ones on that list, depending on what the budget is, those get done. And it's just like what you do with your own home. It's like, I thought I needed to do this, but I really need to do that. And, and so that's what, that's what gets fixed every year, is sort of what we can fit in with that budget from a process point of view. So there's some things that have been done, some things that have been fully done, some things that have been partially done, and it's been based upon what the needs were and the budget were at the time, just like you do at home. So the other thing I just want to be clear on is that, that capital improvement plan that was out there, um, that was really to stay where we're at. There's not a lot of improvements in the buildings. That's keep the same roof, keep the same windows, keep the same hallways, keep the same lights, keep the same, pretty much keep the same everything. What we're looking at here is actually improvements. We're talking about, here's a cafeteria that works as a cafeteria. Here's an auditorium that works as an auditorium. Here's an entrance that's actually secure. Those are capital improvements, okay? Those were not in our capital improvement budget before, period. So this is a very different thing. And so if people have questions about how those capital improvement projects are uh, reevaluated and stacked, well, every single year, we have budget meetings, the facilities director is there, we have a list of them, we go through them, they're sitting there probably now on videotape, you want to see any of them, they're available. So this has been out there, it's known. Whether there's a good summary of it, that's been a challenge, as you know, and we've recently had some personnel shifts that I think have made it much easier to sort of get data and summary, and uh, I'm very pleased with the direction it's, it's currently going. So that information is available. Um, you want to come to the podium? I guess we'll just wing it. You want to come? <laughs> uh, my name is Tim Dew. Uh, I actually work at the school as a part-time ed tech. I uh, just started in the fall. And, uh, I have a son in first grade. Um, so I see this stuff from both perspectives. And, you know, one thing, you know, I talked to Jason over the school a few times um, when, when I noticed, I think we spent $15,000 um, already just maybe to start this up. That was my understanding. And then now we're talking about another quarter million dollars. Um, you know, we, we bought a house that was 30 years old. Um, and so we assumed. We're, we're, you know, you talk about this chart is, is no different than our own house. Well, I say, okay, we're probably going to need a new roof. Call four, you know, three or four different companies to come out and they give us free estimates. Um, if I have a problem with my furnace, three or four companies can come out and give us free estimates. Um, I'm kind of wondering, you know, one other thing that I've seen around the school um, in my own experiences. In, in the middle of winter, it's 10 or 15 degrees outside, and I'm seeing windows being raised open. Um, and so I see some things that are, seem to be low-hanging low fruit, um, where someone like me, just as a homeowner, do-it-yourself type of guy, can walk, walk around and see and say, you know, why are we opening windows? Why, how about we just close the vents um, and do stuff like that? So I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, if. There's some people on the on the board that I might be able to talk to privately and get a little more insight on some of this stuff, as far as really making sure, you know, especially in this environment where, you know, one thing that concerned me looking at homes is seeing, you know, the the property tax increases year after year after year. <coughs> um, the, the increases were the consistent increases were more of a concern probably than the number itself. To, to give some context, we're coming from North Carolina. We're, we lived in Orange County in North Carolina, one of the highest tax counties in the state. We we're paying $3,000 a year in property tax. Um, I know you can look at other areas of the country that are paying much more than they are here. So, um, But, you know, we had beautiful schools, we had beautiful museums, beautiful libraries, our roads were great. Um, so, this is all new to me. I've never gotten involved in any of the stuff like this. So. You know, this is a start for me, but I hope 
that a lot of these questions are being asked and, and we're saying, what do we really need? You know, and, and are we really, you know, is, you know, my understanding is a quarter million dollars is not even, not even the whole thing that's going to go up from there. That's going to be even more money before it actually spending any money on hammering a nail. Um, and maybe that's incorrect too, but anyway, I hope there's some, some really passion and some, some drive to make sure that we're really spending this money how we need to be spending it or how, we, you know, the money that should be spent. We're looking at the easy solutions and the easy fixes um, before we, you know, get our huge dream list, I guess, of, of what we really want. So. Um, thank you so much sure. for, for your, your statements. And I, um, I think it's a good point to say that, um, well, you, you asked how you could address some of your concerns. And personally, you're always welcome to you know, reach out to any one of us, myself, or, um, and we could meet privately, or you can email us, or whatever your observations that you've had since you've come to the district that you think we should know about. Another, another option, um, which I hope you will consider, is um, once we um, get to the, to the next step, which is after the referendum in June, um, we plan on forming a committee uh, based, uh, uh, composed of multiple um, people in the community, teachers, administrators, students, families, parents, um, town council, a police department, um, citizens, and uh, we'll, we'll take a request for people who might be interested in participating in that. Um, and then from there, we'll, we'll, we'll form a consistent large group that we'll meet on a very regular basis. But in addition to that, because we don't want to leave um, you know, the input from, from people who aren't in the committee out of, the, out of consideration, we'll be ho holding um, public you know, workshops for further participation. And um, I'm sure we don't have anything devised yet as how to solicit direct um, written um, opinions and feedback from, from everybody, from all stakeholders. But that is definitely um, top on our list in terms of pursuing this project. And also, um, as we've said, uh, you know, the, the, the figure right now is, is a range. And as uh, the engineers and architects continue to move forward and, and we I identify and prioritize what is you know, most important, um, you know, th there, will be a, there might be a time where we, there's some things can't get done because something else has risen to the top. And uh, we want to approach all of it sensitively and in a, in a, pro in a plan that is, um, most uh, in, in a process and a plan that is going to be most acceptable to our taxpayers. Okay. Just, just one last question. If, like on a specific example, with um, the the network not reaching at the 300 foot or whatever, right? I had that problem in my own house. That, you know, I put a repeater and solved the problem. So I, I'm just kind of curious if, if as taking that specific example. You know, instead of you guys going and pushing the ceiling tiles up, couldn't we couldn't we reach out to IT companies and have them come in and let them push us to, and and do that a, a, on a more cost effective basis as opposed to having? I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> trying to save a buck here. <laughs> I think you know, uh, what you will find in construction is that you can do that for one thing and you will save money, but when it comes to the logistics of a whole construction project. There's a lot of mobilization that's required, and you save money by doing it all at once. And every time a contractor has to mobilize, they charge you the mobilization fees. And at a small scale, it works. And at a big scale, it doesn't. Do, does it make sense to split some of the things? It, it would make sense. I mean, can we look at that? I, I think that is is on the table. I think okay. you know we can have discussions about all these different ways of, of breaking it down. So I appreciate that. And I did want to address that for people who have not gone through a kind of a big capital um, <laughs> construction project before, um, you get competition at multiple levels. So you will have competition from a general contractor who has subcontractors, but but they're going to bid out every portion or every trade 
to multiple subcontractors. So they will get multiple mechanical, electrical, plumbing, security, um, uh, IT, millwork, uh, flooring, sub. Like they'll get numbers from a lot of different subs, maybe three, four, five in every single discipline. And every contractor will package those into what they feel is the best package. And so our job is to put together a really cohesive, tight set of construction documents that's very clear about what we want, with room to let them do their job and try to give you the best price. But there is built-in competition into the process. Uh, it's not that one contractor can come in with all of his own guys and charge you whatever he wants. Um, just like you get multiple bids for a boiler replacement in your house, the contractor would have multiple bids for a boiler replacement as part of an overall, an overall mechanical package, for example. Valerie? Um, I just wanted to say that it was really um, gracious of you guys to extend that offer to do the, the reduced upfront cost of the study, and I think we all appreciate that. But. Um, under the circumstances, because we are facing such a significant loss in state funding, um, an idea that was tossed around the other night is what if we put this out a little bit. And so um, from your side of this, you've already put in some time and done a little bit of work. Would there be additional costs incurred by the school if we were to put this out another year? I think where, where the initial costs come in are, are so I can't, right. Christopher, Other than right. the interest I think it's, it's twofold. It's, it's the cost to borrow the money, and then it's inflation in construction, which on average is about 3% a year. It, it, it ranges. Um, but So if you, if you figure in increased cost to borrow money plus increased cost for the money for the work itself, that's where the potential liability is, but not directly for Margaret. And I did want to address your comment initially. What we actually did with our fee is we didn't really reduce our fee. What we did is reduce our scope. So we were told this would be a figure that would be more appropriate, and we said we can put together a package of deliverables that match that fee. So. And, it, and just to clarify again, the fee, the quarter million that is being tossed around, is actually not for a study. A study is part of that. But it's for design work on all the work that we're showing you. It's far more than just the study. It's to take all of this to the next step. Do you mind following up on that? Because I think that was a question that someone had the other night, is what does that encompass? Um, if I could, just to kind of get it out there. Um, again, we're a very transparent company. We, we always joke we're all our cards on the table. Um, I'll, I'll run through the numbers as, as we done, as we worked through with, with Howard and the committee. So after we after we were selected in uh, November, I'm sorry, September of last year, we the committee said, "How much is it to do a study for three schools?" We said, "About three hundred thousand. Um, that's not going to get you in the ground for five years." Um, and uh, so all the safety issues began. We were talking with folks as, and talking with the folks in the committee, and Howard had his list. We we're reviewing the report from 2012-13, and these safety issues popped up. The service life issues popped up. And the committee and, and our design team began to float out the idea of, hey, we've got some time this eight months. Why don't we study these things and see what it would look like to put this bond package together and, and address some of these issues and get into the ground quicker? Um, so then the committee said, oh, how much is that? And so, again, um, for those of you who are, haven't been in large capital projects, Normally, um, architect and engineering fees are generally ranged between 8 and 14% of the cost of construction. Uh, we have approached this at the 8% level. Um, and so we looked at basically big round numbers and said, OK, in order to get through the 30% design, and remember I said earlier when I was introducing the project, at 30% design, we're not just guessing at dollars per square foot. We've actually got better data. We actually have construction cost estimates that we can really rely on which is what you want when you go to a bond. Um, I just actually heard this morning on the news, I'll share this, Town of Caribou um, is, uh, is looking at a large school right now. They're way, way, way over budget 
and they've gone all through the process to get a bond approved. They're sitting there with a bond and they have a project that's way over budget. And we can't have that. We can't spend all this time. That's why we need to go to this 30% design, which they call um, uh, schematic design. So our price for the schematic design was 760,000 and that included the study to get 30% of the way through this. Um, Howard and his team came back and said, hey, the state's not giving us a lot of money. We need you guys to see what you can do for us. We went back through, looked at our numbers. We found some efficiencies and we came down to $711,800. If you're writing that down, I'll repeat it. $711,800. And Howard looked at us and he said, yeah, that's not gonna make it. <laughs> We're never gonna get there. Um, and so we floated out the idea, um, Bless Austin over here came up with the idea, he said, well, in the pre-bond work, we could do a reduced scope. Let's do just enough to get through the design, push up all the ceiling tiles, review all the work that's been done before, and get you to the bond. Um, and that is where the 249,350 comes to. That's the number. We can get you to the bond, get you to a bond vote with a package that you'll be proud of with construction dollars that are meaningful. Um, after that, we still need to get to 30% design. We still need to validate. We still need to go through all the code requirements. Um, and that's where we said, we, why don't we roll the balance of that $711,800 minus the $249,350, put that in the bond. What that does is it doesn't come directly out of your pocket. Yes, you have to pay interest on it, but it is wrapped up in the bond. And that comes to $462,450. That gets us to 30%. And then if the bond's passed, we race to 30%. And then we finish out the design um, a year uh, in December of 2019, bid it through the winter. And as soon as the uh, frost comes out of the ground in 2020, we're making changes to the school. So did I need to repeat any of the numbers? Austin, do you want to I wanted to sort of follow up on a couple of points. Our fee, our architectural fees, are based upon a schedule issued by the BGS, Bureau of General Services. So it's a schedule that outlines the building type and the percentage fee. So we're working on a base fee that everyone in the state for public school work works on. So it's very fair and it's been very tested. And uh, Howard also pointed out in this process that Kaylin just generated that uh, when we get to the bond, there will be another public process. There will be another RFP process for architects and engineers. So it's not as if we are architects for life. We are just to that certain point, and then it will be an open process again. So. Good evening, thanks for the chance to speak and um, thank you for that presentation. Uh, my name is Kristen Riley. I've been a resident for Cape Elizabeth for over 10 years. My husband grew up here as well. I'm from upstate New York originally and uh, I don't have a specific question but I do want to point out a couple of comments. Um, so thank you for this information again and I noticed some of one of the, one of the talking points that I heard was that some of these upgrades haven't happened in 24 years. And 24 years ago, Tom Hanks won an Oscar for Forrest Gump. O.J. Simpson was flying down the highway. Nancy Kerrigan was attacked. And I was in second grade, or seventh grade. And I wasn't worried about the things that my daughter and my son in Pond Cove now have to worry about. The world is different. The world has changed. And the points of entry that we are discussing, they were fine back in 1994. They will not do in 2018. And if we're looking at category three wires that are next to water <laughs> installations, I mean, I don't know a lot about IT infrastructure, but I do know that on a category three wire, you can only shove so many electrons through it. And it, it, it can't handle any more than that. And the amount of data that we are processing and the amount of data that we are going to process with the increased infrastructure, with the iPads that very soon will be able to accommodate artificial intelligence and machine learning, I believe, within the short order before we next do these upgrades, that infrastructure cannot handle that type of data processing. 
And I believe that the people who put these things together, they need certifications, they need the proper training. And I am just as all for DIY and everything that goes along with that. I'm a big believer in it. I can sweat a joint and I can change an oil filter with the best of them. But the reality is, is we are not just preparing for the next five years, we are potentially preparing for the next 25 years. And so what I'd like to leave you with is a story about my brother, who is a teacher in upstate New York, and he just started there in a school district. And I said, hey, Brian, how are you? What do you want for Christmas this year? And he said, actually, I'd really like a fire ladder, and I'd like a bar that I can put across the door for my students because I can't protect them with the building that I'm in. And my hope is that we thoughtful people who, yes, push and pull and have good conversations and have good debate, that thoughtful people will make the decisions that are necessary so that our teachers do not have to call their family members and say, hey, wouldn't it be great if instead of for Christmas this year, when I turn 27 next month, could I have a bar to put across the door for my students because I want to keep them alive. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Nasser, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I think uh, on that note we should end, <laughs> personally. <laughs> we should leave with, leave with that energy. Uh, it's, it's well spoken. Thank you very much. Uh, I know for short of time's sake, um, you did not cover a lot of stuff that was in high school, weight room, uh, the natural gas above the ground, and if when you take the cover off, you can discover more stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that's hidden uh, as well. Uh, I, I wanted to, as you, as you know, we have three campuses just across the street. We have police, we have fire here, we have this town hall. So when you talk, and we, as you know, the, the internet is all based at school. So the question is, can those generators, or the one or two, multiple, also be tied into these public buildings as well? So we can take advantage of it? So your question, just so I, that I understand, is uh, with regard, excuse me, with regard to generator sizing and how many buildings that could back up. Unfortunately, I mean, you 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 could have a generator that could power multiple buildings. However, there are underground electrical feeders, wire, copper wires that have to feed directly to that generator from all these other buildings. And even though everything is conveniently located on on the campus, which is great, by the way, um, unfortunately, to have a generator back up all of those buildings isn't very uh, isn't very effective. You would have to have a, a local generator at each location or a hookup for a portable generator. Am I right that don't we have a generator here? Yes, there's a big one right in the back of uh, yeah. that one. Right. Right. Um, no, sir, to, uh, to answer your question about the hidden stuff, thank you for saying that. Um, we always sound like we're the doomsday folks when we say that. There's more up there. You just don't know it yet. Um, so um, Howard and the committee, and we all agree that they're in the budget line. There's a line item of $4 million. And I know that sounds like a lot, but we're only 3% or less into this thing. Um, and that actually could be a big number, it could be a little number, we don't know, but there's $4 million in the budget for all that unknown stuff that's up there. Um, and we'll keep reporting every, I mean, I hope we do this once a month, it'd be fantastic. It's been a great open process, and um, as the number goes up and the number goes down, we'll share it with you, and, and uh, that's part of the public process. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to sort of put some of this in context because I, I want to save money as much as anybody. So let's just say, um, so have a comparison. Let's say we do none of this. We just, we just don't fix any of it up. So, and then and down the road we're looking at a new building. So, because then we're going to invest in this one and it's just like, let's just not do that. So what, you know, what, whatever down the road, what a new building cost look like today if you decide we're just going to just like, we're, we're just going to go and build new building for, you know, one school, 500 kids, ballpark. 
Because yeah, so the, the, the only we can really do is, is give you square foot numbers, right? That's that's fine. So, so I, but on, on some sort of one significant figure kind of number, because I, I think it's important for people to know that you you can either invest in and keep what you've got going to your sixty year life. You can really? say, you know, we're just going to run it out and get, no, get the new one. Trouble putting a number on the table because it really it could be a wide range. Uh, you know, building materials, the amount of equipment, the size of the school. You know, it, I would say you could estimate between four hundred and five hundred fifty dollars a square foot, which could easily be, depending on the size of the school, size of the gymnasium, and all you know, if it's a half separate auditorium, all that stuff. You know, it could easily push what you're seeing in other towns anywhere from thirty-five to, to fifty million per school. To answer John's question, what is the assessed value now? And once you renovate and build all this, what would be the assessed value then? Maybe that can address the, the, his, his the question. The value of your schools? I don't know. We don't have that in yeah. So to give, to give you an idea, we are, we are projecting that the new work would be about $350 a square foot for the addition work that we are proposing. And the renovation work would be a little bit less. Um, but you know, we're only proposing to touch a relatively small square footage. Right? If you level the school, right, you have well you have a couple of issues. One, right, where are you going to put the students in the meantime? Right? So we're probably means that we're going to take the ball fields. Ball fields. The ball fields right? of the and large build your new middle, middle school, school right there. Right. And then when the middle school is finished, we will demolish the middle school. And we could build a new elementary school on top of the middle school. We'll phase it out and it will drive up construction costs because will add escalation, um, you know, at 3% a year. Um, but, you know, I think you can easily say, you know, based on what we're seeing elsewhere in the state, you know, $50 million for a new school is not out of reach. So Pine Cove Middle School is uh, 60 to 100 million replacement, brand new kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> so, so that, and that's going to last you if you don't take care of it 24 years, if you do take care of it 60 years. Okay. Yeah. So. You'd, be, you'd be breaking my heart because look at the graph and when you're hoping to get 60 years out of this building and you'd be terminating it right there at 24 years, you'd be killing me. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh I understand, but you know, you're looking at this and you're saying, oh, we're not even going to get a shovel on the ground for five years, so we're now, we're at a th now we're at a 30, so, so maybe we should just let it, and so I just wanted to, because those are real choices that people need to know the impacts of the choice. Yes, and someone had and So that's why I want to be clear, that, that there's no free choice. <laughs> There's no free choice here, yeah. so know the choices you're making is what yeah. I want to be clear with. Chris? Not, not to belabor this point, but to try to come at it from a different direction where you probably get a straight guess. Uh, is it more cost effective to maintain the current building or to build brand new? It's better to maintain it now because, I mean, as we point out, a lot of portions, some portions of the building are much older, but the significant core of the building is only in the 24 year old range. So we are better off maintaining the current one rather than just driving it into the ground with no maintenance and building a new one number. Yeah, um, let me give sort of, uh, sort of put it in perspective from 10,000 feet is our government, believe it or not, this is going to make you really proud, our government keeps their building 67 years between major rebuilds or tearing them down. They, are the, they keep their buildings longer than any of us. Next, right behind them are colleges and universities that keep their buildings for 55 years. And then there's the folks in the commercial trades that are right around 20 to 30. Think about that, 67 all the way down to 20 or 30. Um, company, our company, Colby County, we do a lot of government uh, renovation and work and we're doing renovations in the $120 a square foot range and I think you'd be very proud how your tax dollars are getting spent. So. And so the fiscally responsible approach that will cost us less in the wrong, long run is to do this maintenance now rather than yeah, if we were if we were here if we were here in 24 more years where we'd be at the 50 year mark, we'd be having a different discussion. I think to John's point, we'd be saying, are we going to really dump 20 or 30 million dollars into this for to get another 10 to 15 years out of it with all this crumbling infrastructure when there's all these new classroom types and new building materials out there, or is this the, is this the end of life? Um, Sure. You Probably only so that the the recorder can hear you. Sorry, I know I don't like it either. <laughs> this idea that just letting the you know the thing drive it into the ground is is uh, 
has many other costs associated with it besides just driving a building down into the ground. One of the differentiators for Cape Elizabeth is our education system for our children. And we're well above average, and what we'll end up with is well below average if we do that. So this would impact the school, I mean, impact the town across the board if we, so I, and I think the points that you're making, Chris, are valid, but these, uh, uh, there are other considerations besides that. This is an attractive town to live in because of the education system we have in the town, and that would not be the case if we did this. What was your name? Chris. Chris Wool. Thanks. Uh, Jamie? Um, I, if I could, I wanted to pick up on a point that um, Nasir made. He was asking about the generator potential for powering other facilities and stuff like that. So number one, as was mentioned, there are other facilities that have the backup power. This is one of the middle school Pond Cove is one of, I think, two major facilities in town that doesn't. Um, but then the other thing, as it relates to the IT infrastructure, <clears throat> when we didn't have power, um, that has impact beyond just the schools. So a lot of the town's IT infrastructure, for example, the servers and other networking capacity and things like that, all relies on this same equipment and this same um, technology. And so it's not just the schools that are impacted when there's downtime due to storms and power outages or capacity issues or equipment failures. Um, so as we're looking at this more holistically, I think that's something to be kept in mind. You know, there was an example from our last storms in March where the town had to basically, you know, run payroll manually because we were out of power and, you know, there was no other option. Um, you know, on, on this basis alone, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's, you know, even if we don't do anything else related to some of these recommendations, which I'm, I'm not passing judgment on, it is absolutely critical that in a community like this experiences the weather that we kind of that we can count on, that we we make these um, necessary changes uh, relative to the infrastructure and and things like that. I I wholeheartedly agree with that. So, Valerie, sorry, I'll go to you. Thank you. Um, Respectfully, John and others, I don't think anyone is proposing that we let these buildings <laughs> fall apart. I think um, that there was some concern and the reason that we kind of wanted to suss out some of these issues. Frankly, the, the presentation, the initial presentation was um, somewhat unpalatable because some of the proposed projects seemed um, unnecessary, like the field house, for example. Um, I, I understand that would be a fantastic thing to have and it would be great and it would be lovely if we could have everything we wanted, but, but um, sometimes you can't have everything that you want immediately when you want it. And so we wanted to sort of figure out what, what are the things, we wanted to refocus on what are the things that are safety related, what are the things that are going to maintain our buildings <coughs> and, and narrow our discussion down yeah, a little um, bit. Howard, can I start this? Can, can you back me up on this? I, um, so the process as we move forward, James, can um, is through all the listening, there are people that are very passionate about athletic fields. There's people that are passionate about the pavement and the underground utilities. And then we're, as we go through all this listening that we've been talking about, we're going to get every idea. Um, somebody's going to want a yo-yo a yo -yo classroom. We're good. We're going to write it down. It's probably not going to get very high on the list. <laughs> um, we, as engineers and architects, look for, look for payback. Um, we look for things that are going to keep us on the curve. We look for things that are important to teachers to, to keep the quality of the teaching up. And those are the things we're going to recommend. And through this public process and this building committee that was mentioned, you know, you folks are going to select and say, no, we want this one near the top of the list. And, and we recommend from a payback, longevity, longest life, um, best classroom teaching opportunity, uh, best architecture, best natural light coming in. You folks will have your own and, and everybody else will have an opinion about where we should spend the money and that's part of the public process. Did I, did I cover that okay? You did. Oh, all right. Matt, did you want to ask a question? Sorry. Yeah, just a bit of a quick clarification uh, on what Councilor Garvin was speaking about with the power generation. It is a huge challenge. And I mean, one of the beauties of having 
a school town campus so tightly put together is that we would have that option with the power generation to have that. Uh, we did, we were shut down uh, at least two days this, within the past 12 months, possibly three. Uh, I know Howard and I were here on a couple of different occasions when we were both, you know, we were closed, but we were both here. Uh, and luckily we had the chief, the fire chief who ran the utility truck over to the middle school so we could run off that generator to run the middle school and run our IT section so we could actually pay our bills and get them done on time. That's a, that's a significant challenge, but it, that is something that, you know, we do find a need. And we've got this great generator out back, but, uh, and it can power this building sufficiently well, but with our servers located in the IT room in the middle school right. for the whole campus, if you will, uh, that has provided us a bit of a challenge. And the other thing is to, uh, is to adequately power it. Uh, whereas I know the high school faces some challenges where it has uh, generating power, but it's not enough to really push it to the level that you need to have to, to be open. So exactly. we did lose a significant amount of food and things like that that happened during those during our, our fantastic uh, month of March. So uh, that's just something you want to think about as well, uh, yeah. just as an aside. So thank you. Jessica, did you want? Yes, thank you. Um, just also to, you know, to add a little more to uh, Councillor Randall's question, um, and I, something I had already alluded to, but I'm very interested in the safety and also the infrastructure uh, uh, renovations and um, building. Uh, however, uh, you're stating, uh, and I think it's, I am a little concerned about what I see as a bit of a premature uh, race to a bond referendum this June when for 27, over 27 million, that's a very big project and there are a lot of things on it. And, you know, it would seem to me that it, um, for that there needs to be a discussion now community-wide and I don't know how this can happen between now and June 12th to you know if I'm if I'm understanding your timeline you're, you're maybe off. I'm not you're, you're, off. You're, you're, you're off. I'm a year off okay thank you because I'm thinking you know we we don't know you know so 2019 okay that's much better thank you yep. No, yeah, uh, to Council Randall's uh, earlier question about if we can delay it, right? I was wondering if you can address uh, what is the process of getting a bond approved and uh, are we competing with other schools or other bonds in the nation or the, in, the, in the state? Can you just walk through and then maybe that can help us address some of the concerns? Howard, did you want to answer that? Sure. Oh, okay. there, there are, are two uh, traditional routes to, uh, to for funding a school project. One of them um, is to apply for state funding. The state has so much money available each year, and um, and because the price of projects have gone up so much over the last number of years, they do fewer and fewer projects. Um, and the state comes out. You have a plan. And they come out and look at your building, look at the plan, and they um, give you a, a, a ranking. The ranking is only good for one year. And they go um, from the, the, the top uh, of the schools, they feel that the school that is in the worst condition, has the greatest need, is number one. And let's just say they have $100 million to spend, and that school was 20. They've got 80 left. They go down, they just keep going down until they have no money left. The next year, if you weren't on the, on the, on the short list, they re-scramble it again. And they look at all the schools that apply and where you might have been number seven, now you may be number one or you may be number 20. And it's a, it, it's, if you don't, it's a very long process. Um, Normally, the, the schools that receive this money have a, a, a great fiscal and a financial need. Um, the, the what what many schools do is is um, is put a, a a bond package out, and they they it's competitive. They they they, they bond the project. The community has to show how much debt they have and their ability to pay, and most of them. Um, that I've ever done have, been, have gone for the 20-year option, not the 30. 
Um, I think, in my opinion, is 20 is better for sure. Um, and you um, borrow the money, and at the end of the, and if you say that you were to bond a project at um, 20 million, and the project came in and was completed at uh, 19 million, that additional million can go back and have the voters approved to pay off, have use that to pay off the, um, the payment on, on the debt. Um, and you can't, you can't exceed that. Is that basically you've been in your experience? Yeah. And I just wanted to add that we're trying to um, align the construction timeline, the time it takes for us to do our work diligently to get all the public comment, to work it all into construction documents with a school calendar, with the bond dates, and not to, you know, Kaylin is a, is a taxpayer in Cable, so I'm not a taxpayer in Cumberland, but, um, you know, none of us want to spend your money recklessly, right? We want you to spend your money wisely, and we don't want you to get ahead of yourselves. We don't want you to pay for a bunch of design work and then have a bond fail. But we do need to pay for some design work so we know we're adequately sizing the bond. So our, our plan is to get to a certain stage that realistically, whatever the projects are that are on the list, and I realize that there's a lot of opinion on what those are, whatever that list is, right, get that to a set of 30% documents like we've been talking about, where you've only obligated a relatively small portion of the overall fee before you try to get the bond approved. If the bond fails, right, the bond fails and we go back to the drawing board. You can try again in another year, we can revise the design, we can change the cost, but you haven't paid us for 100% design. If you pay us for 100% design and the bond fails, and let's say it fails another time, then, then you have not money and we're, we're conscious of that. So we're trying to make sure we, we stage this in the right order. I just have one quick clarifying question, um, and I'm sorry if this has been answered several times, but this uh, roughly $250,000 that came down from three quarters of a million dollars, is that the cost for the actual work that's being done for this upcoming year, or is that a percentage of the potential full product project? Does that make sense, my question? Does it cover the work being done or is it coming from a percentage of the big piece? Like, how do you come up with that number? It's kind of both, that's why. Right. Uh, um, to answer your question is, we'd yes, love yes. to have. <laughs> uh, it's both. It, we asked by the committee, what could you get the number down to? We looked at the hours we could spend. We have, if we say you should go out for a bond for these projects at this dollar figure, we have to have done our work because if we fail, we've failed you. Um, it's likely that's going to be more than 250000 but we believe in this group and we believe in this process. Um, if, so the answer is yes, it's, it's, it's going to cover whatever's needed. We don't know what's going to come up from all the interviews or pushing up all the tiles. We just made a rough guess at the number of hours we would take. Once the bond is, if the bond's, we're all, everybody's happy the bond gets passed, we go and we complete that work and really get down to the level of detail. And there'll be a contingency built into the bond like there is on every construction project. Um, if the bond doesn't pass, we're gonna, we're gonna lose that money and that's okay. We, part of the team, we, we all talked about it as a group. Um, we've enjoyed this process from the initial interview with Catherine and company and, and uh, we've, uh, we believe in the project, so here we are. Jamie. Thanks. Um, great point that you were making, Seth, that I want to follow up on. So I'm sure that both your companies have probably, through the work that you've done, experienced putting in all that good work and time and expense and getting to the point of a bond and the bond fails. We had that happen in this town a couple of years ago with a library project that we were working on. I don't, I don't think either of your companies was involved in that. but. Um, can you help me to better understand that if that outcome does happen, while not, it, you know, it could be for any number of reasons, and, and from a process standpoint is not desirable, but it reflects obviously the will of the community. Um, 
you're not really starting back at square one though, right? So, no, so, so that for those sunk costs that you've already invested into the project, um, maybe you could talk, maybe you have examples from other instances where this has happened in your portfolio of work. Yeah, yeah, you were, I, I would, yeah we weren't, wasn't trying to say that you would start back at square one. Uh, you know, the money, I guess, would only be lost, so to speak, if you never approved the project, if the, if the bond was never approved, right? Then you've spent money on some level of design documentation that's just sitting in a drawer somewhere for a project that it never gets approved. But in theory, you could go back, right, for the next vote, and we could do our homework on why the bond failed and make another run at it. You know, there might be things we add to the project that then need to get designed, uh, you know, or there might be parts of the project that drop off to pull the cost down. But no, it's not like all the work is just gone. Um, but we're just trying not to over leverage the town until the town's on board. Um, if that makes sense. Jessica? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask, I think, the same question, but maybe in a different way. <clears throat> and just to preface it, um, Jamie and I were both on the transfer station um, committee, and we, we bonded a, a redo of our transfer station. Uh, I was on the library planning committee um, after the failed referendum. And with the library committee, we, we worked with the uh, architect firm, and I believe that was about $50,000 $50, for the planning with architects before we got to the point where with all, we had a citizen, a, a, a committee of cross citizens, a cross section of citizens, and for that $50,000 we worked for an entire year with this firm, came up with a project, uh, and then went to bond. The transfer station, I believe we spent 75,000, I believe it was 75, uh, or maybe it was 75 for the library, oh, and 50, library. yeah, I'm sorry, I had it in reverse. <laughs> 75 for the library, 50,000 for the transfer station, and again, with a, a citizen committee, we spent actually eight months with that committee um, coming up with plans, detailed, whatever. We had um, a very uh, defined um, uh, agreement, contract, whatever you want to call it, for all the deliverables that we were getting for that initial planning phase. Um, so my question, giving, that, giving you that little um, preamble is, and it may be the same thing Jamie was asking, but I'm, I'm not sure. If, my understanding is you're basing that the, the 250, your fee is roughly 750,000. That's still your fee based on a $28 million or 27 to $28 million bond. You've agreed to drop that to 250,000 right now, which the school board's been telling us, which is very nice. But that, as I understand it, is still based on a 27 to $28 million project. If after a year, so you've reconfirmed that a, a bond package would they're hoping for in June of 19, if after a year of citizen committee work, planning, this project turns out to be a $15 million project and not a $28 million project, have we overpaid you 250000 for that? that that's, that's what I wanted to ask. I'm sorry, I've, I've left, obviously I've left out a detail. <laughs> Is the other beautiful part about going to just the 30% and then sort of getting this bond vote is, you'll, then we'll know what the value is. And we told Howard and the committee that at that point, then we'll know And this 8% number that we've been throwing around as a percentage of the whole for design, that would be factored in at that point. So if it's 15, the fee would get adjusted. Okay. And then if it's, if it's right. 28, then we continue on. Percentage of the construction. Yes. Yeah. Right. We'll okay. adjust it right. to match the construction. All right, thank you. You don't mind saying your name and your address. I, I haven't asked everybody, but okay. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Lindsay Tucker. Um, my address, too? Yes. God, that's loud. Um, 33 Woodland Road. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit um, back to the safety issue and wondering if there's any discussion around any of the safety changes happening sooner. 
um, because I'm glad to hear that there's a possibility of if we were to go in this direction that it, it could be compressed, the whole project. Um, but that's still two, two to three years out. Um, and it seems that that safety piece, is there any way that, I just keep picturing the, the front doors of Pond Cove in the middle school. It's ridiculous. It's always felt ridiculous to me that you walk in and there's nobody there. And that, I don't think we can wait two or three or maybe four years for that to be addressed. Um, is there anything in the interim? Like I keep picturing like, you know, the, off, the middle school office being moved to the front door with like some temporary walls put up or something. And I know it's so much more complicated than that because there's all the wiring and the cables and blah, 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 blah. But it, but I would love to know if there's other, if there's other options. Cause it, it just seems, it seems too long to wait for just that basic level of safety. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yes, the short answer is you know, funding, availability, dependent, you know, of course we can put forward solutions faster. Really, I think that we would need to identify really what that looks like uh, in some more detailed study, get realistic numbers, and then, you know, it's up to everyone in front of you to figure out how, how it's paid for. Right, and I know, I, I mean, if you're doing something temporary, it's, you have to pay for it, obviously, so it just adds more costs, but, um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I think um, that it is possible, to, as um, people here who know more about than I do, to do something temporary. It, it wouldn't be particularly pretty or um, um, ideal, but it would be a buffer. It, would, it could be a buffer. And um, what I don't know is, would it require the f front office in both of those schools to really move? It may be that it not, but whether that there is a, uh, a person there that might just greet people and check them in. And that wouldn't require, that wouldn't require the, the ch I mean, the offices have to be confidential. They have to be, um, there's a lot about them that we won't get into right now, but, I, I, but, but, but your point is really interesting. I think there's something that could be done that would be um, a, a step forward. I also would point out that town council is um, entertaining the possibility of, of um, support, supplying, supporting uh, a school resource officer. That person would only, uh, we don't have that right now. That person would, could only be in one building at a time, but it's really a big deal, and it's a step forward. So that's something that will be that could be very different as soon as next year. Um, I know that our um, our uh, maintenance department, buildings and grounds, is exploring right now the possibility of ways to for teachers to um, secure their doors in, 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 in a way that we can't right now. Um, so that could be something that we we'll actually will be perhaps purchasing these mechanisms and training teachers to, to be able to lock the doors, I mean, to secure them way beyond putting in the, the lock. So that's something that we're talking about right now. We also have improved communication between schools uh, that's a big part of safety is communication. We're in much better shape this year than we were last year with communication. And next year, it's all out about drills, drills with teachers, drills and testing with students, um, moving them to, to locking doors, um, exiting the building in an organized way with buses, exiting in an unorganized way by, uh, by fleet on foot, getting out of the building and going to certain places. 
and then we'll pick out the children there. I mean, we haven't been doing the drilling that we're going to start doing next year, and we finally now have worked really hard on coming up with a plan that we like. It's involved administrators and nurses and teachers from all of our schools, not teachers, but nurses and administrators, fire department, police department, and the county um, um, safety emergency safety organizations have also been working with us. So next year, there's gonna be a lot more training. And I heard from some mothers the other day that their, their children are looking for it. They want it, they wanna know what do they do in a, in a, I mean, it's just, the point's been made several times tonight. Things have changed, sadly. And um, the children are apparently asking for it. They want to know what, they, they wanna know how this works and what their role is. So. Those are all the steps, I think, next year that you'll see. Most of those will be in place next year. Again, not complete, uh, but, it, but better than we are, but a better place next year than this year. Mm. That's so good to hear. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I'm really, really glad to hear that. And I also want to say um, I'm really glad to hear all of this. And I personally would love for all of this to be able to exist in this town and in our schools. Um, it's, it's really exciting to hear, and of course I get that there's so many questions and considerations, and, um, but, um, but I'm really glad to hear that all of this is being discussed um, and in support, so thank you. Thank you. So I, I think unless there's any other burning questions, we'll probably um, wrap it up here. I don't see any, but um, I, I just want to, you know, th thank um, everybody from Colby Company and um, the architects uh, firm that came here tonight um, and came forth with a presentation for a relatively short notice workshop, which we really appreciate. Um, the purpose was to address specifically uh, safety-related concerns and why we have included um, this line item in our budget so that there's clarity for the public and for the town council to know. Thank you, town council, also for participating and coming tonight. We really appreciate your questions and your, um, your time. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Sorry. One last comment. Oh, sure. If anyone has any follow-up questions or anything, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to answer them and give you all the right information. Great. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.